you're rare. I, I like when I meet people like you, right? Because it's just, it's like, we're doing life together. <laughs> right. And this is a real deal. This is a real thing. Hello. Hello. You go by Douglas or Doug? Douglas, I prefer, but either's fine. No, Douglas is great, man. We're doing it today. You excited? Oh, yeah, this is fun. I'm glad to be able to do this. It looks so official back there. Well, you know, we try. Oh, I'm really excited. I have, um, we're, we're filming a movie over a number of days here. It's got like me running at 5 a.m. and like all this different stuff that I do. They're showing like what my day looks like. And um, the videographer's here and he's set up and that's why we got this like cool blue cinema light over here and everything. Excellent. And he's like, um, who are you talking to? I was like, C2 of NASA. He's like, why why he talk why is he talking to you <laughs> i'm like i'm like i don't know we're just like talking about technology and like life and it's, it's cool <laughs> Very <good. laughs> yeah it's, like, it's pretty relaxed we just kind of hang out and i need a cup of coffee you got a cup of coffee yeah i got some i got some um like water but um this mug um william sonoma cto oh is that right? yeah <laughs> very nice yeah, so was, so I expect a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> we'll you up. Don't worry. Well, either that or a lapel pin. One or the there other. you go. <laughs> Actually, um, on my blue suit jacket, I have an American flag pen. I'm awesome. Very, very yeah. proud of my standard issue NASA lapel pin here. Not too bad. Yeah. See. That's amazing. Yeah, it's nice. It's pretty nice. No, it's very nice. We'll get you. My, that would be amazing. My father um, retired Air Force. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's actually how he got into technology. He had not a good childhood. So at 18, he went and joined the Air Force. They educated him and he worked for the Air Force out in um, McDill Air Force Base in um, Nevada. And then he got all his electronics design and education um, through his uh, just while working in the Air Force. And then he came out, he had kids, he taught me technology and here I am. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, man. Well, you're doing you're doing God's work. This is awesome. We we anything anybody we you're like a great partner to have. Anybody that's helping us get kids and folks generally excited about science and technology, doing the right thing. Oh, have you heard about? Uh, do you know about our little STEM foundation that we have? I do not. Oh, so my mom passed away, and I, um, my brother and my sis my sister's a science teacher. My brother's a physician, and I'm an engineer, and so. We said she left us $25,000 between the three of us. And we said, what could we do that's better than paying, going on a trip to think of like, what could we do that's cooler? And so uh, my wife was pregnant with my daughter and we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if they could remember her by maybe a children's book? Wow. So we wrote this children's book up here. It's called The Princess Physicist. And it's about a princess that gets stuck in a tower, but instead of a guy coming to save her, she finds a book on physics to get her out of it. Oh, that's, yes. that's brilliant. So, so I hired one of the illustrators that like works for the Disney type companies that do all the children's books. And we, she, it was only like $2,000 to have the book illustrated. So we took the rest of the money and we started a, a charity and we printed up thousands of copies and then started giving them away to like homeless pregnant women shelters and in, in need wow. type charities. And so that's what we did with the, with the money. That is really cool. Really. Yeah. Cool. We'll send you some books. I'm going to send you some books. Oh, that's, I loved it. That is mm -hmm. really cool. And congrats got, on the daughter, man. Oh yes. Um, you have kids? Oh yeah, of course. Right. I've got, I've got to actually have two older kids, two older, okay. um, in their thirties and I have grandkids They between them, they have eight grandkids. And then I've got a son that's nine. That's just keeping me really crazy, busy fun so, now, yeah. did they did they follow are they in space are they in, in tech oh, where are they at my my daughter's one's uh, um one's an mba and one's an attorney um so they both love science did well did undergraduate work in science but they both went their own ways which is part of the joy of being a parent is being able to celebrate and enjoy whatever turns them on and just you know hey, be, be the best at whatever you choose to do yeah she's she's starting she walks now without us she's walking around the house oh it's cool and I'm just like, every morning, you know, I, I do get up really early. I'm running at 5.30, but 
I, by the time I get done with my run, I go and I get her up out of bed and I get those morning smiles. And I'm like, these are the moments that I'm going to remember forever. Right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's really cool. And I, I think, I think daughters are especially fun. So my, my two girls are still my, like daddy's little girls, you know, so. <laughs> oh. And then we uh, just found out recently that she's due in April with a boy. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yep. Congratulations, man. Yeah. We yeah. figured we oh. had all the baby stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we, when we sorry, go ahead. We can get going whenever you're ready. Oh, we're already halfway through the interview. Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, we just we record it. This is the show. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. So I saw that you were. I'm going to talk about some of the stuff I'm most interested. In. <laughs> I saw uh, F35. And the, then also the Raptor, you know, my, so my father, when he was in the Air Force, his team, his unit was responsible for putting GPS into the B-32 stealth bomber. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 I remember he told us about like 10 years ago, because it finally was declassified. <laughs> there was a limit. And yeah. he was true to that limit. He didn't tell his family or anybody until it expired. As he should, right? Very good. Yeah. Very good. Now, those are just incredible airplanes, and I, I was really um, very lucky, very privileged to work on both the F-22 Raptor and, and the Joint Strike Fighter. So, yeah, I think um, don't you know? So I, I did that till I was about forty-two ish. So I had a whole career, twenty years, and then um, and then I thought, what could be cooler than that, right? And then I had this opportunity to come work for NASA, and it is actually cooler, which is oh. it's a pretty high bar. So it doesn't disappoint. No, it did. It has not disappointed. It still hasn't. Yeah, it's still pretty cool. So Douglas, walk me through that. Like you're 18. Tell me how you get to where you are today. Oh man, that's so. All right, that's a. Um, I have a pretty unusual story. Pretty much everybody you meet at NASA, that's certainly in my age group, you know, all will say something about Apollo, right? That's the spark. That's the thing that that ignited their passion, right? Uh, my story is a little different because I was born in Jamaica, um, and like in the rural, I grew up in the rural hills of Jamaica. Have you ever been there? It's not the resort with all the glitzy stuff, right? It's, it's in the rural, literally at the time, most people don't have running water, don't have electricity. Um, you know, and I'm in this little one room schoolhouse, right? And our teacher reads every day, whatever she could get her hands on to motivate us, right? Um, and so in, some, in 69, she started reading us telemetry in the newspaper, the telemetry from Apollo, the downlink to telemetry to Houston. And we were just like all just captivated. And that was, that was it for me. I was captured. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And so, you know, I was probably eight years old at that time. And whatever it took to, you know, go figure out how to be a scientist, be an engineer, I was gonna do that, to be a part of that team. So it was really um, literally the catalyst in my life personally. And that's why I'm so, passionate about this, so motivated about, and motivated about the kind of work you're doing, right? Just to get that same inspiration, that spirit out to as many people as we can reach, right? Because yes. my granddaughters, we talked about, my granddaughters are kind of in that age group, eight, nine, 10. And, um, you know, I feel like in, in some ways, they're in a very similar situation where there's a lot of distraction, a lot of negative stuff going on that they can easily get, you know, sucked into. And I'm really grateful to be a part of something that can help to inspire that next generation and give them something to kind of, you know, aspire for and be motivated by. So right. I, that's what gets me just jazzed about coming in every day. I love it because I, I love your energy too. I, you're, you're rare. I, I like when I meet people like you, right? Because it's just, it's like, we're doing life together. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's a real deal. This is a real thing. So what does a typical day look like for you? Um, you know, it, it varies a lot, right? So I spend a lot of, when I'm in the building, we have, because I'm part of the senior team here, um, we spend a lot of time in meetings trying to go through the strategies and plan what we're going to do. This, today, for example, you know, we just had a pretty significant event over the weekend. We had a, an anomaly and a launch in Russia, which you may be aware of. Um, so we had a, an abort scenario, which is a pretty critical uh, flight regime and fortunately crews are all safe everybody's great but we're kind of going through that and figuring how we're going to really incorporate the lessons from that and, and recover um, as much learning as we can from that so we don't you know have that situation again um, so we spend a lot of time doing that but I really spend a lot of time outside the building we're going to go to Cornell at the end of the week I was a tech 
last week. Um, so I spent a lot of time out with universities for two reasons. One, to do exactly what we're doing now, just to get the, the you know the word out and get um, to make contact with graduate students in, in STEM disciplines and get them excited about what we're doing, but also for me to learn what they're doing and the great research that is going on at all over you know across academia. There's a lot of good stuff going on outside this building, so I spent a lot of time outside and um, kind of learning about what's going on there. I spent a lot of time in industry with the other agencies, the DoD, our friends at Air Force. Uh, I lead a partnership with um, our, you know, the chief scientists of the Air Force, chief scientists of the NRO, and the other communities that are involved in space. So I spent a lot of time collaborating and getting that crosstalk among um, other agencies and other, both private sector and academia. You know, that's so interesting. Like, I love the value of that. I first came across this, with this concept of mycelium. They're like these little organisms that transfer information between the roots of trees and the soil and they can actually broker nutrients. And when I saw the value that that brings to an ecosystem, I was like, this is cool. This is, uh, this is where I belong. I like, I like this ability to, to engage with people and be that bridge between communities and conversations. That's a great point. And I, you know, I think the other thing that, I, that my other responsibility, right? So the CTO here is a little different than, a lot of times that um, in corporations, CTO refers to IT specifically, information technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, my job is really to look across all the advanced technologies that we do across the agency. So that's you know everything from structures and, and, and propulsion and avionics and everything, right? Um, but, that, but I'm also responsible for innovation and our innovation culture at NASA, which is probably this sort of, sort of secret sauce to NASA. It, you know, what keeps NASA at the forefront is really that, that innovation culture and the the thing that's vastly different than it was when we started is that when we started out in the 60s and 70s, most of the invention, most of the new technologies were being developed inside NASA, right? And today we have a very different system, a different situation where, um, you know, with all the investments going on out in Silicon Valley and in industry generally, there's just so much going on that, you know, kind of like you said, being a part, figuring out how to be a part of that ecosystem. Uh, a lot of my job is trying to figure out where we, are unique and where we can most efficiently use our money to do the things that only NASA can do. And at the same time to leverage and foster all the great work that's being done outside. So that, that whole idea of an ecosystem is really what becomes an integral part of our innovation sort of culture right now. So it's what was, you know, not just about knowing what we're doing, but about being super curious about what everybody else is doing. And rightfully so you can bridge the gap with innovation time by knowing that other technologies that you may be able to integrate or leverage exist in the market. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson, have you ever gotten to meet him? I have, and I think Neil's awesome. Is he, is he as cool in person as you would expect if you had just like consumed all his content and everything? Yeah, you know, I, I think so, right? So I've so. <laughs> meetings and I think guy's super smart and he's just a fun person really, you know, so that, that's a cool combination. I had seen one of the th things where he was talking about um, the public private partnership, right? With power tools. He says, one of the reasons we have power tools is because of NASA. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, you, and you could go on and on, right? There are many examples. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that that's not just sort of an accident, that it's, it's an integral part of our mission. And they're really only, you know, NASA was really formed to do it, the, the space acts of 1958 that created NASA is actually really specific about us doing two things. The first one is to do the exploration and discovery in space, which everybody kind of is aware of. But the second part is to, to ensure that that technology is having um, maximizing impact on other parts of the economy and just the quality of life generally. So that's actually that idea of spin-off. I really think that word sometimes misplaced because it sounds like it's accidental, but it's actually very purposeful that we want to be sure that the investment that the nation and taxpayers make in NASA has benefit in space and in science and discovery in space, but has many times more benefit in all facets of the economy. And I mean, I could give you a tons of example, right? Um, it's, it's, I think many people are sort of generally aware that a lot of our lives are kind of powered from space, whether you're using GPS to navigate or, you know, our transactions and the financial systems are all GPS timestamps, our, our, um, our, our energy grid is all focused on, on precise timing that comes from space to enable that to, to work. Yeah, my my 24-hour time format, I'm ready to go. You know, it's something we take for granted, right? But um, all of that's going on sort of in the background. 
And as I said, the cool thing is whether it's agriculture that you're trying to lay down a precise fertilizer, you know, automated fertilizer thing um, pattern that's also enabled by GPS, right, and precision nav from space, um, or you're just doing your, your cell phone, just communicating with your family or watching TV or whatever. It's sort of kind of transparent, but it's not just – it's not just enhancing, but it's foundational and critical to the very, you know, everything we do in life, right? All the computers, all the digital life that we're, we're living in, the, the benefits that we have. And then there's other things that um, are even, maybe, maybe people would at least, many people might see that connection very quickly because they're technology and kind of digital things. The things that maybe are not as easy to see is that we also have a lot of life sciences and, you know, kind of human system research, right? I mean, obviously to make, you know, help people live on International Space Station for a year at a time. There is a lot that has to happen. Um, much of the consumables of air and water that the, the astronauts use, they're actually recycled, they're actually regenerated on station. Well, those technologies have immediate impact, right, to create clean drinking water in remote, remote areas with all the filtration systems. So we license those, and, and those are in use in Mexico, in Iran, in Africa, around the world, right? So... You, you kind of get the, the technical side, the technology side, and that's obvious, but the side that may not be obvious is uh, literally, you know, thousands and thousands of lives that are saved from having some of the simplest clean drinking water. That's a spinoff of NASA technology. I love it. Now, is that the concept of tech transfer? Can you explain this concept of tech transfer to me? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So, yeah, we call that, you know, tech transfer, transferring techno space technologies into other sectors. Uh, so this is what we're talking about, because I had it on my show notes. I said, it said tech transfer and how it's changing our lives. And I hadn't heard that term before, but this is what we're discussing. That's exactly what we're discussing. Got it. And, and like I said, that's sort of the second part of NASA, right? We talk a lot about the great science that's being created every day. I mean, we're literally rewriting textbooks, you know, with all the information we get from Hubble and all the observatories of space and exploration. Um, but the other side of NASA is just as important that the, tech, that the transfer of those technologies is literally not just improving the quality of life, it's literally saving lives every single day. Um, and so that in many ways um, is a really great argument for, for why this investment is worth it, right? Because even if you're not bought into, which obviously I am and most of us are, into the benefits of, of new knowledge and, and discoveries in space, I think everybody can relate to the fact that we're, we're impacting you know, climate science and understanding um, you know, better, better prediction of hurricanes, better pr prediction of, of um, um, phenomena on, on the earth, right? Um, we're having this impact in creating opportunities for clean water and clean air um, around the globe. There's an air filtration system that's licensed, again, off the, the International Space Station that's really helpful to folks, you know, people for indoor air quality, for asthma and other um, diseases like that. Um, that that technology has been transferred. The other area that may not be obvious is we do a lot of direct medical interventions in space that are required to give oh, yeah. health, right? So you got medical two emergencies don't stop in space. Right. You actually have two parts. It's one, it's a really tough environment, right? So, um, you know, you got to have maintained health in a weightless environment in microgravity. There are a lot of degenerative um, effects that occur from that bone loss, ocular degeneration, there's fluid buildup in the body and so on. There are some radiation exposure effects and so on. So we're constantly working to combat those. And the technologies that we use to do that um, have immediate transfer to you know, similar instances, whether it's osteoporosis for bone loss on, on Earth, you know, we can have um, some of those, those therapies can be transferred there, whether it's radiation effects that can have impact in oncology. So we have a lot of active partnerships with like various medical centers around the, 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 the globe, really, where we're actively engaged in, in you know, collaborative research so we can see the analog in space and where those technologies can be used. The second piece is that because of the fact what you mentioned, you're kind of pretty far from a hospital, so you gotta you know, work with what you've got. We develop a lot of monitoring technologies that are miniaturized so the astronauts can have them on their person while they move around and work. Um, we have also a lot of miniaturized treatment devices, including, for example, a, a DNA, um, a, a miniaturized DNA sequencer that's the size of a thumb drive, basically, right? I love it. Um, so we use that to, you know, look for samples on station. But that's the kind of technology that can be then transferred again. And a lot of the applications are in remote areas where you're far from a big medical center. Um, if you can think of, you know, rural communities in Africa in the third world. 
where you can use the same telemedicine technologies with miniaturized portable sensors locally in situ and then have that um, communication with a big medical center and the diagnostics can be done remotely and the therapies can be applied locally, which is exactly how we operate on station with our medical team on the ground. So those are some of the great examples where we're having immediate impact, literally. No, I love it because, so I watched the, I can't remember the name of the movie, I'm sorry. I watched a movie that was recently made about one of the space shuttle launches. And it was how essentially the entire country came together over this concept of getting getting into space. It was about the females who were in charge, like did, they played a large role in I think the programming or the mathematicians. Oh, so we're thinking of Hidden Figures, right? Is Hidden that Figures, yeah. yes. Yeah. Great movie. I loved it. And the I walked away from that movie wanting uh, Earth or a country or whatever. I wanted us as a collection of humans to have such a great purpose like it, it felt like in every the the director did such a good job in every aspect of life this was a thing and it was like it drew our focus so strong to achieve this goal that everything else seemed to kind of fade in the background yeah. and i i i wish i was a part of that like but i look forward to that happening again and it not being because of like an alien invasion <laughs> right so no, no. So first of all, you are a part of it because we're doing this podcast, right? So you're yes. very much a part of it. And as I said, I really appreciate that you, everybody, everybody is part of this team helping us get that, that you know, excitement out, and that inspiration out, right? That's in, in many ways, that's kind of our product is inspiration for that next generation. And you, st- you said it really well. The fact that we choose to do things that are, as, as Kennedy said, we choose to do these things because they are hard, not because they're easy, because they're hard. And it, and it really measures us as, as, a, as a human race, as a nation, that we can achieve, it, literally it, it make the impossible possible, right? That is literally what our mission is at, at its core. And that is what provides that, certainly provides inspiration for me as a young kid. And I think it continues to provide inspiration for folks. It's funny you mentioned the movie Hidden Figures. We actually, I mentioned that I do a lot of outreach with um, universities. So one of the things we do is we also, we also try to make sure, you know, just as I was in Jamaica in a classroom and that message reached me, right? We try to make sure that reaches as broad a cross-section of our community as possible. And um, I do a lot of outreach with HBCUs, historically black colleges, universities, mm-hmm. and we use that, that movie actually as sort of a, a talking point to start the discussion about, you know, getting folks really excited and using that example of where those ladies in the 60s were breaking a lot of barriers and um, because they were all just focused on getting the job done, right? It, it seems like when we have a, a really um, unifying focus, we really pull together as a country and we kind of overlook a lot of these societal challenges that, that, that did exist then. And it was really a great example of folks just breaking barriers and making their contribution, right? And we want to use that message to inspire all, all the kids around the country, all the you know, kids K through 12, university students, everyone for that matter, that, hey, let's, let's focus our energy on something exciting, something, um, you know, really audacious as a nation where we can be great as a nation and focus all the energies um, in, in achieving that goal. And I think that's really what inspires all of us that come to work every day here. And I'm getting I, goosebumps right now. So. Yeah, you know, hey, <laughs> right? there, I'll tell you something else. There's a lot of things that um, the United States has a lot of tools in its, its you know, arsenal. Some are, some are in, the, in the military, some are, you know, diplomatic. We have a lot of tools with which we affect sort of our, our place in the world, right, you know, across the globe. Um, there are very few, in fact, I can't think of any that have the profound impact of the projection of soft power that NASA has that is entirely positive. Like everywhere I go around the world, right, and you talk about NASA, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, even the French that hate us love <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to not to not get positive feedback when you talk about NASA. But the point is that it's a unifying theme that everybody um, around the globe can can really see where the United States is having a positive impact on the world. No, I, f- I fully agree to your point. Um, Alex is our full time videographer or cinematographer now, and because we have a business outside of the podcast too, and he actually he's so good at video he won a green card like in the lottery because he was living in russia right so then he comes to connecticut last year teaches himself english and he's he did like full-time video in russia but he 
won the lottery and so he brought his family over here because wow. why not and then um i found him in connecticut and i relocated him down to florida we're in sarasota florida and the first thing he gets here he asked me he says um when can when can i go see a rocket launch <laughs> he's like my wife and i we're gonna we're gonna take our son um they have a five-year-old son they said we're gonna take our son we want to go see a rocket launch when's the next Did one he grow up in russia yeah yeah very cool. So, I mean, I, you know, I mentioned about the Soyuz launch, you know, obviously Russians are, our, you know, just absolutely great partners. And we've had a partnership now for, you know, over two decades, right? Building yeah. a space station. And that's an example of where, where NASA has been an amazing tool of uniting people, right? So I could, I mean, that's probably the best example I can think of where we've really, um, you know, forged a relationship that's just an amazing partnership that continues. And we expect to continue that as we go on and, and you know, go back to the moon and on to Mars in the coming decades, we're looking forward to doing that with the international community and continue to work together. And that's, that's the thing that drew me so strongly to the STEM world is because there seems to be like not really borders in STEM. It's just like, let's figure it out. Let's move forward. Let's solve a problem. Let's learn a little bit more. And I, I've always really enjoyed how when you see, um, what was it? I was watching a documentary on CERN um, right. And they were showing how they built it. And it was like a long project over many years. But I love how in the science community, the collaboration happens just, yeah, it's so open and, and free. And I, I really enjoy that. Now, I, I want to uh, ask, because you kind of touched on this. And you were explaining all of this stuff that NASA does, that's great, right. But at no point did you mention launching a rocket. <laughs> so what I, I, I'm curious, the privatization of the, you know, the Blue Origins and the SpaceX, it, it seems like it almost is a benefit to you because now the general public will stop seeing you as, oh, they put the rocket in space and instead allow all of this other, what I think is more important stuff to take the main stage. Yeah, so that's a, I'm glad you asked. It's a really good question, right? So it's been in the press a lot. And it's probably the, I would say it's one of the things that I get questions about a lot that there, there's more misunderstanding around than anything else, right? So remember I said NASA's goal is really to explore space and also to ensure that we have maximum benefit from that investment, right? Part of that benefit is all the spinoffs that we talked about and the tech transfer. But some of the benefit is also in enabling the growth of private sector, um, you know, space faring uh, businesses around us, right? So if we back up and think about the, the last century, the, the 20th century, NASA's predecessor was the NACA, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, right? And that's a government body that invested a lot of money in aviation and creating the technologies and doing all the wind tunnel testing to create the, the database for designing airplanes and start going through World War II and then out into civil aviation. So today we have a aviation, a global aviation enterprise that's worth somewhere like $6 trillion is the value today. And that's, the, that's a great example of success, where, at, where the government's invested in a, at a critical time, is sort of a catalyst in a very critical area, and created the technology that's allowed this, you know, the blossoming of this incredible industry. We want to see the same thing happen in space. So far from thinking of SpaceX and Blue Origin and so on as competitors, which I see sometimes, that's really a very uh, unfortunate mischaracterization, because that's really a measure of success. We're able to create the conditions for which there are, you know, viable economic conditions for more companies to thrive in space, which then can provide, as you pointed to, us with the opportunity to, you know, to, to have more um, partners in our supply chain and as, as uh, you know, as, as valued partners with NASA. So um, we're really delighted to see the work that's going on right now in those, you know, kind of the burgeoning so-called commercial space industry. It's really important to realize that Going back as far as you can to Apollo, right? NASA is about designing missions, about doing that discovery. And to the extent, as I said, in the 60s and 70s, where a lot of techn technology or capability didn't exist, we had to do a lot of that internally. Where that technology exists outside, and not only where it currently exists, but where we can foster and help it to grow, that's great because then that focus, it gives NASA the opportunity to focus on, again, those areas that are sort of the most challenging for which there's no business case where we're the only investor and we can, you know, really focus our energy there and leverage as much as possible that the great work that's being done in the commercial sector around us. Right. So um, as we look at going back to the moon and onto Mars, 
We are, as you probably know, we're developing the Orion spacecraft and the SLS, the Space Launch System, which will, you know, is a, a very large um, space transportation system launch vehicle, bigger than, uh, than the Apollo Saturn V. But that's the kind of power that you need to, to get you know, large systems into cislunar space. Um, so we're building that. But at the same time, we expect to be able to make great use of the capabilities that we see emerging, and it'll be an integral part of the architecture. In the meantime, in low Earth orbit to service the International Space Station, we, are, you know, we contracted with um, a, a number of the private sector companies that are creating capability to provide launch of both cargo and crew. So we've got, right now, we've been for a couple years now, contracting with companies to provide cargo to the International Space Station. That's been a remarkable success. So again, that frees NASA from having to own all of that you know, infrastructure to do that role, but we can rather contract that out. And then we're expecting to do that with um, crew transport starting next year. So it's a really exciting time. If you think about it, for the first time in history, we're operating an International Space Station, which has been crewed now for 16 plus years continuously, right? In low Earth orbit. We're, we're developing a commercial space economy in low Earth orbit, and we're seeing that really take off. And we're focusing our energy on building the new transportation system for deep space exploration. So all three of those are going on simultaneously. It's, it's really remarkable. No, I love it. And honestly, the, the SpaceX and the Blue Origin, it's literally going exactly to plan. I mean, NASA, with the tech transfer, you just tech transferred your rockets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? That's exactly the template that we want to see, right? So, um, you know, a lot, again, you see a lot in, in, uh, in, in you know, you'll see in the press where people will be arguing that a lot of the technologies that are used in, that SpaceX is using were developed in, the, you know, previous in, um, investments from NASA, as it should be, right? That's as it should be. And, um, and we're delighted to see those find a home and, and to be leveraged in innovative ways to achieve even more. So that's really a, a win for everybody and a win for the country. So you talk a lot about innovation and there's this uh, new conference. Well, I think it's like year two or year three. Um, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning, right? Yeah. It's like in that arena like, okay. and it's called Synapse. And they, what they do is it's really unique. So most conferences have like a theme, like a, just a, like we're the medical conference or we're this defense conference. What they did was they took the, the arena and they split it like a pie and you walk through the sections and the thing they all have in common is that they're all from Florida. So you get like space defense, you'll get like drone, you'll get medicine. And so you walk around and you see all the innovation happening in all the industries for Florida. Very cool. Have Very you heard of this before? I have not been there. No, I haven't heard of it. It's in Tampa? Yeah, it's in Tampa every year. I got invited because of the show to, we did interviews of, of the speakers. Yeah. And then they invited me to speak uh, this year, this coming year, it's in January. Uh, but you, like, I'm going to nominate you to to speak there. <laughs> I'm happy to. I'm, yeah. I, I love Florida, and that's a good, that sounds like a great venue, actually. It's like, if there were one event that I've ever been to that would create the most impact in the youth and technology of STEM, it, it's this event. Um, uh, sounds great. Yeah. Sounds awesome. So I'm curious, um, the, the Raptor, the F-35 and the F-22, um, you have, you, you were in like an engineering or a project management style role with those, with those? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So my buddy, Alex, who's uh, one of the senior engineers over at Walmart, he was curious to know in the um, environment of failure and avoidance, right? <laughs> you don't want to make mistakes. Uh, what sort of project iteration practices do you have? How do you ensure the high availability systems? Like, do you have any tips for us on that? So you're talking about specifically with the DOD kind of airplane systems or similar to NASA or talk about NASA as well? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm loosely trying to tie it back to a lot of our listeners make product. They make, yeah. whether it's hardware, firmware product, and they go through these life cycles. And sometimes they get a little, a little crazy with pushing stuff too early and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the thing about, so spaceflight is, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it cannot be overstated. Spaceflight is the most challenging environment, period, right? Um, it's very, it's a very, very hard business. So, you know, as I said, I worked 20 years on stealth fighter technology at Skunk Works at Lockheed, right? Which is pretty cool, pretty demanding, and that was an amazing experience for me. Um, 
I even at, even from the outside, I used to look at NASA and kind of obviously like most people admire what NASA was doing. Um, but I didn't appreciate until I became a part of this organization that it, the bar is a little higher, right? So the reason is there are a couple of reasons. One is that the environment is the most challenging environment because it's the temperatures, pressures, uh, you know, you, you, you know, re-entering a Mach. So you fly a, a supersonic aircraft at Mach 2, Mach 3, um, you know, at that 80, 90,000 feet, and you're, you're really pushing the envelope, so to speak, right? That's not even, the, that, that's a corner of the envelope in space flight where you're gonna fly at Mach 25 re-entry speeds. Temperatures outside approaching the surface of the sun, right? Um, and you know, just to have any material, any system to survive in that environment is is really difficult to explain. Just how hard that is to do from a physics perspective. We literally have one one example that I think is really um, important to just to give you a sense of it. Right, the temperatures inside a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine burning are much much higher than the melting point of steel. But we build engine nozzles from basically steel, and we have a flame inside that's easily is a blowtorch that will melt through that in less than a second. And and what protects that that the, that um, material from that that uh, bur you know from burning through is a thin film of um, cooling film of liquid hydrogen usually or gaseous hydrogen that's millimeters thick. And that's how precise the control is, and that's how small the margin is, right? So when you're operating in an environment like that, there really literally is no room for error, right? And um, and that's something you don't encounter in other systems. So back to, so to your question, if you're designing a bridge, if you're not sure, use the safety factor of two. You put twice the material that you need. And most people don't realize it, but build a structure of any kind, a building, a bridge, do your calculations as well as you can, estimate the loads, and then just multiply by two. So you've got some pad there to ensure that you won't have a failure, right? If you build an aircraft, typically a safety factor of 1.4 is about all you can afford because it'll be just too heavy to fly. When you build a spacecraft, as an example, if you read the movie that's out this weekend, of, you know, First Man with Neil Armstrong's landing, we left the ground with about 6 million pounds of fuel. The Eagle landed with about 10 seconds of fuel remaining. <laughs> Put that in perspective, that's how razor thin the margin is, right? Point is, you can't pad, so you have to get it exactly right. With that being said, you know, so you don't have the advantage of just kind of adding more stuff or, you know, adding a redundant, more redundancy or more mass than you need. So what we have to do is a very, very stringent acceptance testing process to ensure that we know for a fact it's going to work every single time. And, um, and that's, that's different than most industries that accept that testing, a very rigorous um, qualification environment is very different than most industries. And that's what I learned coming in this is that the, the difference in margins and that because of that, the difference in how rigorous the testing has to be. That's interesting. I'm going to look for some, some books written by NASA related type project managers or engineers on how they, how they draw the line with how much rigor is too much rigor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's you know, there's a process. You, you're exactly right, and and um, you know, the, the the important thing to realize is that you really, so there is a discussion about hey, are you being are you are you putting too much safety? You know, what is too much safety, right? Well, I think many of us who are involved in this, first of all, NASA is a is a very different culture than you may find other places because um, we don't have test pilots. We have astronauts who are part of the team who are whose kids go to school with my kids in Houston, with my, my son, literally, right? Who we same churches, we go to the same baseball games on the weekend. So this is a family and, um, and nothing, there is no higher value than safety here, none. Having said that, as I just mentioned, the margins are so thin that you have to be pretty, you have to really stress every possible um, you know, analysis and test just to make it work. So I think it's actually not, um, not realistic to say maybe you're being you put too much pad on it because there really isn't room for very much we have to make sure it's in the right place to keep the system safe and there's just enough to make it work yeah and i'm always just curious like i'm always looking for um i guess a question that's just not it's just not an easily answered question i get a lot of the people from the show they like <laughs> they they reach out and they want to know and i guess this question has come up with not just you with with many 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 people like We've had medical devices and all sorts of things, and they they want like a clear answer to 
you know, they may be building apps and, you know, releasing code and they want to know how exactly do, do these companies that have these life dependent systems structure their re production release type processes. But um, for, I want to talk about some leadership stuff because I have you here and the way you speak and just knowing you, you're, you're a visionary and you're an exceptional leader. And so I've got to know um, with your team that you work with, how do you, how do you go about feedback and doing sort of your feedback loop with your current team about how you improve and how you give them feedback? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. That's a good question. That's a really good question because um, like with everything else, right? It's all about the team. It, it literally yes. is all about the people. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you something that it's, that is a little different than maybe in other places, other, particularly in the commercial sector where I come from. When I took the job here, I'll share this with you. My, my boss at the time, this, the acting administrator at the time called me in and he said, Hey, now I want you to know as a member of the senior leadership team, you look at my resume and you see that I've done a lot with inventing things and project management and so on. And he said something really interesting. He said, I want you to understand that I'm not actually measuring you from what you invent or what you do, um, you know, your personal technical accomplishment. I'm measuring you by how well you grow and mentor your team. And that's a very different way to think about leadership, right? And that's the way NASA thinks about leadership is empowering the team to be as great as, you know, the greatest they can be. Because we have this, we have this incredible advantage that everybody wants to work at NASA. So you get the brightest and the best people and, and really what you need to do is create the conditions for them to thrive and, the, and by definition, organizational thrive, right? Um, the way we do that and have historically done that is really just to focus everybody on what we've been talking about, that audacious, inspirational mission. And as long as everybody can get their energies vectored around, well, everything you do every day is about enabling that mission to occur safely and productively. Um, you you're, you're you could be pretty amazed at how much people can do if they're given a very precise um, mission and given that, you know, empowered to, to go do that. So one of the things we do in my group, just as an example, is we have, um, you know, we'll have a little retreat with the whole group and go off and take a day off and think about what our goals are in our particular organization and the technology investment world that we're, we're concerned with. But we try to talk about what, what is our, who is our customer and what is that customer value? And in our case, that's, you know, that's the leadership team and the mission that we're trying to accomplish. And we look at every single thing we do, every activity, and we try to, we try to analyze whether that's actually delivering value. And if it's not delivering value on that mission to that customer, then we don't need to do that. Or we look at how we can do that better in every one of our activities. And I think, you know, that's, again, that sounds pretty simple, but it's actually the secret sauce, right? Is everybody pretty clear? on what the goal is, and everybody will get behind that because we actually don't have um, the problem of trying to motivate people. We have extremely motivated people. We need to be able to, to challenge, to channel that motivation and have it aligned, unequivocally aligned, focused on the mission at hand and to give people the, all the tools they need to succeed. Uh, that like, you went through like seven of my questions just there. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's so you're you're exactly right because it's like when you were talking about that I imagined an astronaut being with their tube being hooked back up to an oxygen tank like when you have that focus and I find myself as a leader of of my team we, we only have about 7 people but I find that whenever there's a disconnect what I just have to connect them back to what we're actually doing because you get so lost in the details and they really don't matter it also when you have like what you said, that very clear mission and all those people marching towards that very specific goal, it gives you certainty. It gives you confidence in knowing what to add or what to drop because you know your objective. And before it's like, well, you could add a feature or you could not add, or you could do this, you could do that. But then now you have a system, like a filtration system of, of your goals and your to align against. You have like a true north, right, for your, to, to tune your compass to. Now we talk a lot about that. We talk about alignment and integration, right? So it's, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's about knowing where, if you know exactly what you're trying to accomplish, exactly what trying to value you're trying to deliver, then you have a way of measuring everything you're doing and seeing, does that really contribute? Is it, do, can I do it better? 
But the second part, the part you said is really important. Are there things I can stop doing, right? If it really doesn't add any value, can I stop doing that? And um, those are the harder conversations, actually, because we kind of get, you know, whatever we're doing, we kind of get used to doing it a certain way and and, uh, just develop, you know, just kind of embrace the status quo, right? So we're constantly trying to look at how we can break that status quo. We're doing um, an event uh, at the end of November where we get the National Academies of um, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine partnered with them to get our whole leadership team together for a day or two and talk about exactly this, you know, about exactly where we are, NASA are going, um, our future vision, and how we can kind of organize the whole team around enabling and inspiring everybody around that vision. So that's a work, it's a constant um, process and, and we keep working at it. I love it. I, I expected the leadership to be great, but it, <laughs> it was superb. <laughs> Thank you. Now, if you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that be? But only one piece of advice. Yeah. So, so the thing I I actually have the opportunity not to myself, but to talk to a lot of younger folks coming into the business. Um, and it's going to sound a little it's going to sound a little paradoxical, maybe. Um, a lot of what we do it, as you get older is we learn all the things you can't do because it didn't work out. Maybe you had a failure. Um, you kind of develop those scars. And you develop. A, in fact, sometimes those become. Um, officially incorporated in process documents and so on of here's all the ways you can't do something i tell people act like you don't know what can't be done just just blow it up just try something right and, and you know there, now the cool thing is we have an organization where we can say that because we've got senior people that can actually oversight <laughs> right you know you you, you you've got to be careful you don't do something dangerous we talked about safety but it's important to realize that the the guys and, and, and women that you talked about in that film, in Hidden Figures, um, a lot of those guys were in their 20s. There was no handbook on how to build a spacecraft. There was no database. There were no computers. There was no knowledge capture. They were doing stuff that had never been done. And a lot of what they did, they didn't know it couldn't be done. So they just did it, right? We're seeing that today in, in many parts of this industry. We continue to see that by you know exciting developments that we're doing here at NASA with our, you know, a lot of our team in the development, advanced technology work. We see that companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, where maybe these people aren't heritage space folks and they look at the problem from a different angle. They don't know you can't do it this way and they try something that hasn't been tried. And it turns out sometimes that works really well. So um, that's probably the advice you know, I'd give to any, you know, any person. It's just don't get so um, intimidated. It's really important to listen to legacy knowledge and to kind of take that seriously, but don't be afraid to try stuff, right? We've invented, you know, look, we've invented a whole new industry out in Silicon Valley in the last 20 years because there was no handbook. People just made stuff up. Everything you see on the internet, right? Everything we did the other day, it didn't exist. And if you'd asked someone, you know, my age, I might've told you that you can't do that. turns out you can. And I, I like the leaders. Um, I had many mentors that you know i was i learned program very young at the age of eight and then up through 13 and so hanging around my uh, father's office i had some mentors that would teach me things about code and and i i realized that there was a difference between the good ones and the not good ones and i found that the good ones they would know that something that i wanted to do wasn't possible with the code or that was a little bit crazy but they wouldn't say no it's not possible they say oh give it a try and then I'd get it and then I'd get down a little bit. I'd learn something and then I'd get down the road farther and I'd learn something. I, I would slowly learn why it wouldn't work. And I found that that almost can parallel or translate to even the enterprise thing where you find the more senior leaders they, in engineering, sometimes they might not just like slam it down so fast because they've had a, a career of finding out the things that they thought weren't possible were possible. So right. sometimes you let them walk the path if, it's a, if you're up in the air about it. And I think that's one of the, you know, it's one of the most difficult balances to find, right? Because, you know, you alluded to this before. We have safety concerns if we've got, you know, a human crew. And even if it's a, if it's a robotic mission, a you know, Hubble Space Telescope or something, or a James Webb, these are multi-billion dollar investments, right? So it's it's not okay to just try crazy stuff and wing it and see if it's going to work. Right. But, but at the same time, you have to allow a pass for those crazy ideas because one out of 10 of those might just be the answer you were looking for, right? 
so that, that you know, it, it, you, you ask kind of different parts of this question throughout the, the, the talk here. It's important that you have an opportunity for, for people to really innovate and try new ideas, but it's also important that you have in place a system that can rigorously, methodically, deterministically evaluate whether there's a problem there or a failure mode you didn't anticipate. So it doesn't make it onto the final vehicle, right? If there is a, is a but at the same time, you want to give it a fair shot. You want to get, you want to get that data to come forward. You don't want to kill it in the embryonic stages when at the idea stage, you want to give some path for that to develop. And over a period of, you know, you go from a uh, component to bench test to integrated systems test and, and as it proves itself uh, all the way onto the vehicle. Um, and we really are, that's a lot of what our, what we're working on in our innovation culture right now is to sort of remove the friction in that system. Some of that is good filters to keep unsafe practices out of a flight vehicle. But some of that's just kind of friction or scar tissue from stuff that used to be true but may not be true anymore. There are a lot of things we literally couldn't do when we didn't have high-speed computers, right? And that now we can do. Um, so, you know, a, a good example in, in airplanes, right? You know, we, the, 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 everybody who knows anything about airplanes would tell you you have to design airplanes with a static margin that's stable, meaning you have to CG4 to the, the neutral point, right? Because a pilot can't actually fly a vehicle that's unstable. It, it will you know, spin out of control and crash. Well, it turns out with um, fly-by-wire controls and computers in the loop, all those airplanes we talked about are in fact designed to be unstable, right? That would have been a very hard thing to, to explain to, you know, a generation ago who didn't have access to uh, fly-by-wire advanced computing on board a, 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 an aircraft, right? So it turns out you can design an unstable airplane and get all the maneuverability benefits of that, and you can do it safely. Whereas their knowledge base would have said, yeah, you get maneuver, but you will kill the pilot. And it's just not true with the new technology. So we always have to evaluate those, those assumptions and those truisms as technology changes. Yeah, and especially as things get smaller and we have new technologies to now work on different levels. Like I was thinking the other day about the different types of advancements. Like we'll say, oh, this fuel isn't, isn't good or we can't do this with this specific technology. It's like, well, well now what if, what if that becomes very useful now that we can see on, like we have new tools that can do new things, all of a sudden we can see it differently and we didn't even know what was going on there. Yeah, and there's a, and I, I'll tell you, that's, you know, there's so many areas where that's increasingly true. Um, you could, you know, you could point to very specific technology areas where we're, we're in a very interesting time, right? Because the other thing that's happening is that it used to take sort of decades for technology to turn over to refresh, you know? to go from vacuum tube technology to transistor to integrated circuits. So there's a progress over a period of decades that gave a lot of time for those assumptions and those design practices to, and those qualification practices and all that to evolve along with the technology. What's going on that's quite unique is that technology is updating so quickly, right? Like, you know, kind of Moore's law every yeah. 18, you know, months, 24 months, um, that it's really challenging the ability of our, our cultural systems and our, our um, you know, processes inside of businesses to really adapt to that. And that's not just about space, that's about every facet of, of business, right? Um, one example that, I, you know, you could, obviously you could talk about all the digital transformation stuff that's going on, um, that's really changing the way we do everything from um, Wall Street trading to the way we do space flight, you know? And, it, and it's, it's amazing how rapidly that's evolving and really challenging our ability to stay ahead of it. Um, in space flight, there's, you talked about miniaturization, that's another one um, that's kind of enabled by the digital um, developments, but we have literally CubeSats that can accomplish, you know, today, and we've, NASA's flown a number of those, both as prototype um, out of our space technology mission director, as demonstration articles, but we've actually flown some science missions on, on CubeSat type satellites that can accomplish 90% of the objectives that a billion dollar satellite would have would have would have taken to do just a decade ago. That's a big deal, right? It's a huge deal. So I, I think you know there there's um there are a lot of big changes coming our way and, and our challenge is to stay ahead of them. That's my that's mostly my challenge in this office and our technology directorate. That's where our challenge really is to keep NASA at the leading edge of that. And that pace of it is accelerating so rapidly. I love it. And I think you're the perfect person for the job. <laughs> like, 
the, the way you are able to articulate your ideas and the knowledge that you have and the passion and the energy that you bring to this um, position, it's, I don't know if it's a votable position, but I vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. You know, the cool thing is we've got such an amazing team, right? And, um, and I can't tell you, like, you know, I told you where I, where I started. So it's just an honor for me to be, a, you know, a part of the team. And um, I think that's one of the cool things about NASA and probably this business in general is that um, whatever position you're in, right? Like everybody has a really, really important role to play. We have, you know, I, I like to say that it's, it's just as important for us to have the finest um, engineers and scientists, which I think we have world-class people. We literally have Nobel laureates. We have best people in the world. Um, but that only works if we have also working with them, the best human resources people, the best business people to keep this business running right? The, the best um, public affairs people to, to enable us to reach audiences and to partner with people like you. The whole thing works together. And um, yeah, I'm grateful that I've got, uh, hopefully I've got a certain set of skills that let me do my part. Um, but, but I'm even more grateful that we have such an amazing team. And it's, it's really a, an honor to be part of this team. Boom. And there you do it, man. Throwing the love back to the team. You like, <laughs> if I had a leader checklist, you hit all the, you passed the test. <laughs> you're playing us well. <laughs> this wasn't a podcast. This was your annual review. That's right. <laughs> no, but you know what? It's it's um, it, it's one of this is really the thing that I think I appreciate more about NASA than probably anything else. Right? Obviously, I'm just the kind of person that just you know this is what I do. Right? If I'm not at work, I'm watching some TED talk about quantum. Me too. Quantum, right? So just a nerd, and I and I love it. Uh, pretty cool to get paid for something you love doing, which is what most of us are doing. But I mean what I said. What's the, the, the other thing that's really cool um, is to be among a group of people where we kind of share, we have that shared passion, right? Um, so that makes it fun. That makes it really fun. Now, have you met uh, Gavin? He's the CTO of TED. I have. I, I've, I've met him, but only briefly. Oh, yeah. He's a cool guy. Yeah. And I think, you know, like, like I, I mean, I wasn't just throwing that around. I watch Ted talks like, you know, oh, me too. I'll, I'll, I'll stay up all night, which is probably not the best thing. But if I get, I'll get on a, tr a thread and I'll just keep watching them because they're so compelling. I've got a, I've got a good one for you. And tell me if you've heard this one. I'll, I don't remember the exact name of it, but it's about a guy. And what he does is he finds that these small little changes to his schedule and his life yield these massive results. And he's a ends up doing some in big banking and then he crochets or knits and does some, are you, have you seen that one? I don't think I've seen it. I've seen a, oh. I've seen a little uh, short for it, but I haven't, I haven't watched it. He's unbelievable. He just makes these small changes to his schedule and he starts out like he was, um, as a kid, he couldn't pay attention in class and he didn't do well. He was a straight C student. And then he found that it broke into these like 10 minute working blocks. And he just played a video game and then did one little thing over here and then just slowly improved. And then he ended up going to college, being like a, a president of multiple hedge funds and doing extremely well. And then he started volunteering, did a Guinness Book of World Record thing, learned to fly. He, he's done like 40 different certifications wow. where he learns to do all these different things. And he just, and he shares it in his TED talk. And that guy, like, that's one I've listened to more than once. <laughs> Great. Hey, thanks. Good talking to you. Good talking to you. Have a fantastic day, Douglas. Thanks for watching this interview. I hope it brought you a ton of value. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Tune in to the Modern CTO channel weekly for more amazing videos just like this one.